Hello, dear viewers. I'm George from Ireland. Here I am in London on Park Lane, one of the most desirable residences in the whole United Kingdom. And behind me is the house of uh, Sir Moses Montefiore. So uh, he was a very wealthy man, as you can tell by the location. So um, Sir Moses uh, was a very noted um, campaigner uh, against injustice and known for his liberality towards all sorts of benevolent causes, particularly Jewish ones. So um, Montefiore was born in uh, Livorno, Italy. Um, it's um, on the coast of Tuscany. Curiously enough, that's where, that's where um, Shelley drowned. Nothing to do with him. He wasn't in Italy at the time. So uh, Montefiore was born there to an Italian Jewish father and a British Jewish mother. Um, and his father was involved in hat making and various businesses. They didn't have that much money. They had been living in London. They happened to be in Livorno on business when Moses was born. He had a number of siblings. So when he was a baby, they uh, returned to the United Kingdom. They lived in London, in Kennington, just south of the River Thames. And London was only just expanding there um, at that time. This would be because of coronavirus, this is empty. On a Sunday morning, and under normal circumstances, be very busy. But I thought it would give you a bit more perspective, the idea of the size of his house. Now, not all of it is his house. Further down this building, it wasn't. You see other doors. And I remember in 1998, this was, it was the uh, Mozambican um, embassy. Anyway, uh, so uh, he had a desultory schooling and he had to uh, end his education early to go out to earn his keep because uh, family, family finances were not in uh, good shape. Anyway, he um, worked for someone who was dealing in tea and uh, he became a broker himself. Uh, was semi-successful at first and then some rogue defrauded him. He lost everything due to a notorious swindler called Daniel Yelkin. Um, but anyway, he managed to stay in stockbroking, buying and selling various things, getting into shares, uh, and eventually made a huge fortune. And he worked with his brother as well. So he married um, Judith Cohen when he was, uh, my goodness, about 25. And um, uh, she, her, her um, brother-in-law was a Rothschild, as in from the very famous banking family. So um, him and his... Um, brother-in-law, in-law, if you see what I mean, uh, Montefiore and Rothschild, they worked together and they had a very a fruitful partnership. So he became a very wealthy man um, uh, in short order. He, he was also uh, gigantic by the sounds of the day, standing at six foot three. I mean, I'm six foot one, so I'm well above average height. So he would have been like up here or something. Um, anyway, he joined the Surrey militia, which is like part-time army uh, uh, towards the end of uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so you do your ordinary job, stockbroking in his case, and then you have some military training where you're ready to fight should the country be, be invaded. And you had to provide, quite pay for a uniform and musket. So only fairly well off men could do it. Um, and he, and his, he and his wife had no children, presumably for um, medical reasons. So there is a rumor that he sired a child by a teenage housemaid. Not sure if that's true. Um, anyway, after the Napoleonic Wars, he um, traveled all over Europe and he was a Zionist before Zionism was invented. Uh, and he tried to intercede for Jewish people who were victims of injustice in other realms, uh, people who are wrongfully imprisoned for various offenses, or the uh, notorious Edgardo Mortara case um, in the Papal States, that's in Italy, when the Pope ruled central Italy. So um, there was an affluent Jewish family who had a Christian housemaid. And the, the law said that um, uh, no Jewish family could bring up a Christian child. And uh, the um, infant turned very ill, so their um, Catholic housemaid, she baptized the baby because in extremis, any Christian can baptize anyone else because this um, housemaid didn't want the, the boy to go to damnation for dying unbaptized. And actually he recovered from his illness. And then she told the authorities that she had baptized him. So the um, papal authorities seized the infant and said, well, you know, the law says uh, a, a Christian child cannot be brought up by Jews, including if they are the parents of said child. And there was a dispute for years and years. I can't remember the outcome at the end, actually. I have a feeling they got their, their baby back. Um, so uh, he was hailed as a, as a savior by many uh, Jewish people in Eastern Europe who were suffering heavy oppression. Now, the United Kingdom was not innocent on this issue uh, because Jews were discriminated against by law until well into the 19th century. Uh, if you want to hold all sorts of public offices or go to um, university, and there are only two back then in England, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, you had to be a member of the Church of England. Latterly, you could be a Protestant of other churches, like a Methodist or a Baptist. Um, that by the late 18th century, they could get away with it. And then, 
1829 Catholics, we could go to um, the university or hold these public offices. It was the same in Scotland, it was the same in Ireland, despite the fact that Catholics were the majority in Ireland. Um, and then finally, by the 1840s, um, uh, Jews were allowed to do all sorts. Another thing is, if you weren't born in the United Kingdom as a Jewish person, then you couldn't be naturalized because you had to um, attend uh, worship uh, in, in, in um, the Church of England. Um, or the Church of Scotland, if you're in Scotland, and so on. But uh, as a Jew in good conscience, you couldn't do that. Now, he was born overseas, but born to a British mother. So then he was a British citizen. Well, they would have said subject in those days. Um, so he seemed to be well accepted by the establishment. He met the monarch on many occasions, and he gave away lots of his fortune to good causes, particularly to Jewish people living in penury uh, overseas. Um, so he was knighted, Sir Moses Montefiore. He's the first of Jewish knightage I can think of. Is a very long and distinguished list these days. And he tried to set himself up as a, as a country gentleman. So this um, knight of the Shires, he uh, built a um, stately home for himself near Ramsgate. That's on, on, in Kent, so on the, on the southeast coast of England, right on the corner of England. Um, anyway, uh, unfortunately that was demolished in 1954. So he's the most outrageous act of cultural vandalism. And he built a mausoleum for his good wife who predeceased him by 22 years. Um, he, it was modeled on um, the tomb of Rachel near Bethlehem, and he, he lies beside her. So the tomb is still there. They built a little synagogue for himself. So he fought a rearguard action against um, liberal Judaism. Now, um, uh, so obviously it exists, and Orthodox Judaism exists, but it was a fairly new thing in his time. And it was a time of coming out of the ghetto because throughout Christendom, Jews were discriminated against by, by law with just a few honorable exceptions. And through the 19th century, these laws were repealed. Um, Napoleon was not anti-Semitic, one of his few saving graces, um, tried to address the, 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 um, the nation of Israelites, as he called them. And when he conquered lots of Germany, he repealed their anti-Semitic laws. And some of the German states didn't bring those back afterwards. So some German Jews, took his name, Schoenteil, which is a, a translation of Bonaparte, as Buonaparte, like good bit. Um, anyway, uh, so then that led to some um, anti-Semites in Germany saying, oh, well, they're obviously fifth columnists, they're, they're treacherous, that's why Napoleon was helping them out. Not true. But um, uh, so various states abolished all these laws. 1848, Jews were emancipated in Germany by then in most states. Uh, so then Jews could come out of the ghetto, could attend uh, religious institutions, sorry, educational institutions, which had previously been um, barred to them, well, from which they had been barred, I ought to say, uh, for religious reasons, and uh, prosper in the learned professions, um, and, and even get on in trade when they'd been somewhat restricted in the, the trades they could pursue. Um, and so promotion in the army, the civil service, uh, and getting into politics and all the rest of it. Um, so he was elected um, High Sheriff of London, um, that was a, somewhat like a law enforcement position. It's more of an honorary one, attending major trials. Uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to do that. Sheriff, it's derived from the Anglo-Saxon words, or shire, meaning county, and reeve, like a law enforcement official. So shire reeve was corrupted into sheriff, one for each county. And um, London was classified as a county for these purposes. By, by the, in the, those days, by, by the city of London, they really only meant the area around St Paul's Cathedral, not out here. This would have been considered, um, goodness, Marlebone, I'm not sure, Tyburn. We would have been considered about five miles uh, west of London. This, some of this would have been, would have been countryside in his uh, childhood. Um, so at, attending uh, major trials, and you serve for one year only. And there's an under-sheriff who's a solicitor who does the actual uh, work. Um, I just think, what, what else should I say about him? So he died when he hadn't quite reached the age of 101, but he was a very popular figure, a pillar of the establishment by the time uh, he died. He persuaded some Jewish people to go and settle in the Ottoman province of Palestine at the end of his life. Um, he strictly observed kosher dietary rules and had his ritual slaughterer traveling with him to butcher any animals he wanted to eat because he wanted to know that these were in accordance with, uh, with, with Jewish law and thought that the Jews really had to stick to all the rules and wear a yarmulke and uh, all the rest. He um, was elected president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, set up in the mid-18th century just to represent the British Jewish community to try and regulate what was going on, to, to clarify the rules, um, which still exists. Now, it used to be on Bloomsbury Square. I don't know where it is today, actually. Um, so he really was head of the Jewish community in, in a civic sense. He wasn't a religious leader, he wasn't a chief rabbi. And he was a congregant of Beavis Mark Synagogue, as in the one that Disraeli, 
attended. And he may well have known Disraeli, because I've been into that synagogue. There's not that many seats, 100 or 200. And um, uh, the, the Disraeli was considerably younger than him. Well, was, let me see, 20 years younger than him, to be precise. So they, they must have known Disraeli a little bit when Disraeli was a child, of course. And Disraeli lived around the corner um, for a long time, around that way. I mean, literally, the next street around the corner. And um, uh, when Disraeli was 12, of course, he left Judaism and the whole family converted en masse to Christianity. So um, uh, Montefiore's brother had children. So uh, his nephews and grandnephews really blazoned forth his reputation. And he's got lots of collateral descendants, like the noted writer um, Simon Sebag Montefiore. Um, really, so his, his surname it means a mountain flower in, in Italian. Monte is the mountain, and Fiore is, is the flower, like Bloomberg. Often um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews have that one. He's a Sephardic Jew, um, of course. Um, so his family had been in Italy. A lot of people that name you find them in Spain, um, or they fled Spain to Portugal when they're discriminated against there. Some of them lived in Morocco and so forth, or moved into France. Well, that is uh, probably enough about Sir Simon Sebag Montefiore. Toodaloo.